Well, my great joy is proclaiming Jesus, and so let me invite you, if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Ephesians 1. Now, if you've read the handbook, you'll, you'll know that that is not what I was down for speaking on. I was down for speaking on Luke's gospel, change of plan, 24th of February 2022 is going to go down in history when Russia invaded Ukraine. We woke up, and this might be a different world we're living in, and we might be on the brink of another major world war. And when I started to look at my social media, my Facebook, and my Twitter, and and, and just so much happening, and so many people praying, and so many scenes, the teacher who was bloodied, that 60-year-old, and and then the the tank that had driven over the car, and and, and the sheer panic of people queuing, trying to get out of the country, and then the men saying, I'm going to stay home and fight, and then pastors saying, go if you want to, but stay, and let's turn the church into either a, a, bomb, a shelter or a hospital, and let's care for those who, who have to stay, the poor, those who are going to be widowed, those who are going to be orphaned. And as, as uh, all these things started to lay heaven, my heart, I thought, you know, I'm going to change my message. Let's not think about the motivation for, mini- for mission, love and compassion, and, and, and Sarah just did an, an outstanding job. Let's think about the resources we need for this mission mandate we've been given. The the, the title of this conference, Restless for Mission, makes me instantly think of a prayer, actually, of Augustine. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. Right now, this world is restless. Right now, some of us are restless. We, 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 we so want to use the spiritual gifts God has given us and our lives to serve the advancement of the kingdom. We cannot do that on our own. We need our Savior. We need His Spirit. We need His help. So we're going to be thinking about the resources that we need for mission. So if you've got Ephesians chapter 1, Let me just say a quick word on this. Apostle Paul, he's a pastor. He planted a church in Ephesus. I don't think this letter was to the church he planted because it's not got the the sort of familiar, intimate sort of language. It's probably a circular letter for the churches that have now emerged in Ephesus. And so he writes this letter. First three chapters gives the theology of the gospel. Final three chapters unpacks how that theology is worked out in people's lives. Chapter 1 has this breathtaking beginning. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And then Paul goes on in chapter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 to unpack those spiritual blessings. Do you know the spiritual blessings you have in your relationship with Jesus? in your union with Christ. Well, he says there in verse 4, we've been chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. Then he goes on and says, in love, we've been predestined. And then there's another blessing, we've been adopted. And then there's another blessing, and he says, we've been redeemed, verse 7. We have the forgiveness of sins. And then he says, we've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And it's just blessing after blessing after blessing. And all of this we have in Christ. And then Pastor Paul prays like a pastor. And he prays, not for something new for these young Ephesian Christians, but he prays that the eyes of their hearts would be wide open to that which is theirs in Christ. So let me read verses 15 through 23, and then we'll get stuck in. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. 
the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Rupert Murdoch, you know the name? Media mogul, owns Sky News, Fox News, newspaper tabloids. Before he was the big deal, in the early 20th century, there was a guy with the name William Randolph Hearst. He was the guy who put into motion the way that newspapers are published. And as a result, he became a multimillionaire. He had mansions all throughout the world and in America where he lived. And um, one of his favorite pastimes was collecting antiques from all across the world. Paintings from Europe, 14th, 15th, 16th century paintings, rugs from Syria, vases from China, antique grandfather clocks from England, you name it, he had it. He filled his mansion, built storehouses to contain all that he amassed. One day he's sitting in his drawing room of his mansion and he's, he's reading a, a, an antiques collector's magazine and it <laughs> speaks about this really rare, I think it was a painting, and it says this is the painting that everybody wants in their collection. And so he picked up his phone and he phoned his agent and he said, listen, I'll give you all the money and all the time it takes, but I want you to find this painting. I want it to be part of my collection. And so his agent set off on this mission looking for this rare, valuable piece of art that no one knew its location. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and then finally there was a knock at the door of Mr. William Randolph Hearst, and it was his agent. And you can imagine the excitement, the anticipation. Did you manage to track down this piece of art I'm looking for? An agent said with a huge smile on his face, yes, sir, I did. And Mr. Hare said, where in the world was it? Well, I've spent a lot of your money. I've taken up a whole lot of your time, but you are never going to believe this up. All along, it was in one of your storehouses. <laughs> you can imagine his reaction. His jaw dropped. His eyes popped. Now, that true story is a modern parable of what you and I are like as Christians. You see... In our relationship to Jesus Christ, we possess great blessings, great treasures, great resources, if you like. But because we fail to take the time to appreciate them and enjoy them, we store them away in the storehouse of our heart, we don't even know that we have them. And so Pastor Paul, wise pastor, prays for the Ephesian Christians, not for anything new, but what he prays, as we see there in verse 17, 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that is opened, in order that you may know three things. Number one, the hope to which he has called you. Number two, the riches of his glorious inheritance in, the state, in his holy people. And number three, his comparably great power. Three things Paul says that the Ephesian Christians need to have their eyes wide open to. Hope, riches, power. Question number one, are the eyes of your heart wide open to the hope that you have in Christ? Let me ask you like this. Do you live is a person of hope. Do you have a deep, unshakable confidence that Christ says what he means and he means what he says? Now, now if we're going to understand hope, we need to define hope. And a good way to define something is to define what it's not. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. Right? Right? So I wish that tomorrow 
It's going to be 27 degrees in Scotland. Wishful thinking. Biblical hope is a confident expectation of a guaranteed result. And let me explain why it is. Because our hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he was raised from the dead, all who trust in him will not die but live forevermore, eternal life. Our hope is rooted in a past event, but it has huge future implications. We are going to live for the rest of eternity in his presence, where there is no sin, where there is no suffering, with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that he has called and gathered unto himself. But it's not just a thing rooted in the past and a thing regarding the future. In 1 Peter, it's called a living hope. That is, it should impact our present, our here and now. Hope isn't just a thing, oh, I I know that I'm going to glory. No, it's going to shape us here in Edinburgh in 2022, post pandemic. God has shaped us in the midst of a potential world war. We've got to live as people of hope. Let me, let me illustrate hope two different ways. When I was 18, I worked in a chemist, Boots the Chemist, and I worked in a village, and across the road was a nursing home. In that nursing home was my grandfather, a late minister, God the old man. And so on my lunch break, I'd leave the chemist and go and visit him. Now, you've all been in a nursing home, right? An old folks home, right? And you walk in, and all the old folk are in the lounge. And it's always like sweltering hot. You can barely breathe. And it's always the, the old women are playing dominoes, and the old men are watching the snooker, that sort of thing, right? Well, I used to go in, and my grandfather was always sitting in the middle of the women. But he was, the problem was, he was always fast asleep. And so the old buddies would strike up a conversation, see my uniform, oh, you work in the chemist. You know, when I was a little girl, that chemist used to be a flower shop. And, and all of a sudden, they would just start telling me their life story. Tell me where they were born. Tell me the, the school they attended. Tell me who the headmaster was. Tell me about how they used to, you know, get the cane and the belt. And tell me stories about the war. And then they would tell me how they got married. Oh, I married old Billy. He was a minor. And then I worked as a, as a, a like a, a typist in an office, and all of these things all, all come back to me. And, and then they would tell me more of their life story. They would say, you know, we, we've got five grown up children. They're all across the world except their daughter. She lives nearby. She's actually the only one that comes to see us. And as their story grew closer and closer to the present, I always remember this feeling, right, of hopelessness. Because they'd say things like, I'm in so much medication that I keep your boots, the chemist, in business. My body's failing me. My kids don't visit me. Some of my grandkids I've never met. And I'd sit there and have this, like, pain in my gut. There's something wrong with this conversation. And there's a part of me that was so desperate, like, no, 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 no. You can look at life in a different perspective. If you know Jesus, like, there's, there's an eternity. And so let me contrast that experience of being with those old ladies who, who, were, who didn't know the hope that was offered to them in Christ with my experience when a carer would see, I'd sat for 20 minutes, I was on my lunch break, and I hadn't spoken to my grandfather, so the carer would come across and say, listen, I'll take you through his room, I'll wake him up, and you'll get 10 minutes with your granddad. So I'd go through my granddad's room, and there he was, he'd always have a huge old, big old Bible in his knee, and he would use those 10 minutes with me, a young Christian. He'd speak to me about Jesus. And as he's preparing to die, his face would light up, his little eyes, and he could barely lift his head, and he would say, Now, Andy, I cannot wait. I cannot wait to see my Savior. That, my friends, is a picture of biblical hope, a confident expectation of a guaranteed result. Now, here's the thing. I turn on my Twitter yesterday, and there's this video that's gone viral of a family, and in fact, I think it's a, it's a, it's a house church, and they're around a table, and they're singing the hymn, He will hold me fast. 
Bombs are dropping, missiles are flying, bullets are being shot, tanks are driving. And God's people in Ukraine are singing hymns that say, He will hold me fast. That's hope. That's biblical hope. In the face of death, to be in Christ is to have hope, is to be in the safest hands in all the universe. Romans chapter 5 says, we have a hope that will not put us to shame. You ever put your hope in a person, somebody you've loved, a spouse, a child, a parent, a colleague, a minister, a pastor, and they've let you down? Of course you have. Ever put your hope in circumstances, hoping that things would just work out for the best for you, and it's not. Listen, if you put your hope in Jesus, here's the thing, he will never, ever, ever let you down. The thing about being a Christian is, the hope that we have in Christ makes a difference. It now has set our future because of his resurrection and it should define our present. You know what Edinburgh City needs? It needs hope. It's in desperate need for the hope of the gospel. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the rich, often behind their, their big walls, often not presenting problems that are so evident, but yet still lost, and in many ways, spiritually bankrupt. And Paul here prays as a wise pastor, Lord, I pray that the eyes of their hearts would be wide open to the hope that they have in the gospel. See, when you you wake up tomorrow, what will fill the eyes of your hearts? The worries of the day, the anxieties, things that you've watched on the news. Let the hope of the gospel be that which fills the vision of your heart. The second thing Paul prays for is that our eyes of the heart, the eyes of our heart would be wide open to, and this is beautiful, right? The riches of his glorious inheritance. Now, this this isn't this is staggering. Do you live as someone who is rich? Do you know that you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are rich beyond anything you could ever imagine? So so in chapter 1, when he speaks about riches, he speaks about the riches of God's grace, which have been lavished on us with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. (laughs) Do you know what grace is? God's undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor. And Paul says here, here's one of the treasures, here's one of the blessings, here's one of the resources we have as his people is riches, the riches of his grace. One of my professors in the mound used to say, God's grace, you know, you would say it's sufficient for our needs, it's tailor-made for us. Now, well back, I'm reading an article, I think it was was on a plane, and you know, you read these articles, and it was about the grandchildren of the Queen, and one of those articles that just really annoyed me, says that Prince George, when he becomes king, is set to inherit with all the estates and all the legacies and all the crowns and all that the, there will be probably something in the region of one billion pounds. I read that article, and I thought to myself, why in the world was I not born into that family? <laughs> And then I remembered, I've been born again. And I have the riches of God's glorious inheritance. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade because it's kept in heaven and it's protected by God's power. Balmoral, Buckingham Palace, they will all rot and waste away. All the money in the bank 
meaningless. Guess what? If you're a believer, you are written into the will of Almighty God. He is your inheritance, and you are His. You are a trophy of His grace, bought at such a great cost, not by silver or gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. This is what 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, He who was rich, that is, Jesus, who was worshipped and adored by the Father and the Spirit in eternity past, worshipped and adored by the angels, living in the inner Trinitarian life, enjoying the bliss and the glory of heaven, he who was rich became poor. That is, he became man, born as a babe in a manger, in a stinking stable, born to a teenage mum and a carpenter or a joiner as a stepdad, spent his early years as asylum seeker in Egypt. His parents, all they could offer when it was his dedication at the temple, were pigeons. He said, Foxes have their holes, birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Homeless, man of sorrows, man of suffering. He who was rich became poor. Question, why? So that through his poverty, you know, the the real poverty of Jesus, he took upon himself the spiritual bankruptcy of all of his people. He paid it in full at the cross. Died the death you and I ought to have died. He who was rich became poor so that through his poverty, you and I might become rich. Now, what, just imagine, we stopped living as sometimes we think we are. We think we're poor. You ain't poor. You're rich beyond anything your mind can imagine. You are rich in the love and the grace of God. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. Now, how would that change mission in Edinburgh? You're rich with God's love. That means you can love the last, the lost, the least, the unlovable, the untouchable. Because you've got the riches of His grace. The unsearchable riches of Christ to make known. You've got, his grace is sufficient for you even when you're weak because his power's made perfect in weakness. And you may have a story of brokenness or of being orphaned or being widowed or of being betrayed or abandoned, but yet in the economy of God, he redeems your suffering and uses it for his glorious redemptive purposes that the grace of God might be made known, experienced and felt by those who don't yet know it. But here's the thing, we Christians, you know what we're really bad for? We've got this amazing resource in Christ, the riches of His grace, the glorious inheritance, and we take it, and we store it away in the storehouse of our heart, and we forget we've got it. Because we don't appreciate it. We don't enjoy it. We're like William Randall first. Now, let me move on quickly, right? Next point. Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts, final point, would be wide open. And this is, this is like... The first two are mind-blowing. This is truly mind-blowing. He prays the eyes of our hearts would be wide open to His incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, 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 now. Notice how He layers word on word. Incomparably great power. There, there's a truth when we say this as Christians. We're powerless. Powerless to save ourselves, powerless to change ourselves. That is absolutely true. You did not save yourself. God saved you. Salvation belongs to God from first to last. When you become a Christian, you're not powerless. You may say, for what? Real? Yeah, yeah you're not powerless. Do you know why? Because God has taken up residence in you by His Holy Spirit. So, 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 so Paul goes on as he's explaining this great power that's at work within us. He says, this is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. 
Jesus Christ, who for three days was in the tomb, dead, 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 because he had taken in himself the punishment for our sin. Jesus Christ endured the wrath of Almighty God, raised from the dead, back to life. That same power that raised him from the dead, that's the power that resides within you and me. That means you and I are empowered. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 3, in his benediction, he says this power is at work within us. You know, when I, when I visit old people in, in, in the church that I pastor, and particularly Cameron, the last church I pastored, as near the end, there's always a striking thing. Outwardly, they're wasting away. And there's this other beautiful thing. You know, inwardly, they've been renewed day by day. It's like because they're so weak, so fragile, and yet, yet they say some of the most profound things like, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come and get me, Andy. I'm just using my final moments to pray for you, for the church, for the nations, for the world. And you and I need to know, right, that in this mission, we've got power. We've been empowered by His Spirit. Now, now this is how it's mind-blowing, right? Try and think about this. I can't. God is one, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes into all of His people and dwells within us. Like, can you get your minds around that? God has taken up residence in you. Your body is now the temple of the living God. So where you go, He goes. So what you do, you do. And, and, and if you do it in dependence on Him, because apart from Him you can do nothing of eternal value, He gives you the strength. And brothers and sisters, if we're going to be about mission in the city, we need power. In this nation, in this world, we need power. You know, it's hard to love people if you love like Christ. Compassion. Compassion is not just a take pity on someone. Compassion is when you feel deeply from the bottom of yourself from within. Compassion isn't just love. It's love that's moved to action. It's love that goes the extra mile. It's love that gives and gives and gives. It's love that turns the other cheek. It's love that gets down and gets dirty. It's love that, my friend says, spell love this way, T-I-M-E, something you and I often don't have much of. You know what you need if you're going to live the compassionate life is you need the power of God to help you. Now, I'm going to bring all this together and use a couple of illustrations. First illustration is this. I like history. <laughs> There's a wee boy called John. He grew up just outside of Glasgow and he was born in the late 19th century. And uh, he was out in a field one day and there was a preacher in all places. Field preacher. And he was a free church field preacher, right? So he's preaching the gospel and we, John, hears the gospel and gets saved. And when John grows up, he doesn't become a free church minister, he becomes a Baptist minister. He gets married, and him and his wife have a daughter. And tragedy strikes his house. His wife dies. And so John has to move his sister in with him to help look after his daughter as he's busy as a pastor. John one day gets a telegram from America inviting him to go out and preach in America at Moody Church, of all churches. And so John goes and buys tickets for the maiden voyage of the Titanic. And you know the story better than I know it. You know what happened to the Titanic? The unsinkable ship? It struck an iceberg on the 15th of April, 1912. And Pastor John Harper from Glasgow, when the alarm was raised that the ship was sinking, was heard saying this, All Christian men, stand back. All women, children, and unbelieving men aboard those lifeboats. And he said to the Christian men, For we are going up but the ship is going down. And then he turned to the orchestra on the, on board the ship and he said to them, 
play nearer my God to thee. Question, why? When you've got your eyes wide open to the hope that you have in the gospel, you know where you're going. Nearer my God to thee. We're going up. She's going down. Well, you know the story that the ship plunged into the freezing cold, icy cold Atlantic Ocean. John Harper jumped off. He had a life jacket, was on a bit of debris, floating around, and this is unbelievable. He's in the water. It's freezing cold. People are jumping in. People are dying, screaming, flailing. People are on lifeboats. And he's heard preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ in the water. Like, this is panic stations. This is like deathbed moment for most people. And he's there and he's preaching, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And there's this man, he jumps in the water and he comes to the top, but he's got no life jacket. John pulls him over, puts him on the debris, takes off his own life jacket, puts it on the man. And then he says to the man, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? The man's totally stunned, says no. Like, can you imagine having a gospel conversation, right? <laughs> and holding a bit of debris, you're preparing to die. How did he do it? Because of the power of God at work within him. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, he said. And the man believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he was saved. There was a gathering six years later in Ontario, Canada of all the survivors of the Titanic. This man gets up and says, I am the last convert of Pastor John Harper. He saved me twice. He gave me his life jacket, and in that sense, he saved me. Ministry of deed. He shared to me the salvation and the hope offered in Christ, and I was truly saved. Ministry of word. Now, you might say, powerful story, great story. I've got an even better one. I'll finish with this. This is from this week. Missionaries were called by their embassies to evacuate Ukraine. Western nations evacuated their embassies and their citizens. The traffic in Kiev on our screens. Thousands of cars trying to get out. This man's a pastor. His name's Vassal. This article's in the Gospel Coalition if you want to read it. This is what he wrote. My wife and I have decided to remain in our city near Kiev. We want to serve the people here in anticipation of coming disaster. We bought a supply of food, medicine, and fuel so that if necessary, we'll be able to help those in need rather than burden them. Ours is a family of six. We're raising four daughters. Think about that. Russia, Russian trips right now are trying to get into Kiev. They're in Kiev. They're there. And this man's there. And he's got his family. And he's kept them there. He writes this in his, later on in the article. How should the church respond when there's a growing threat of war? And there's constant fear in society. I'm convinced that if the church is not relevant at a time of crisis, then it is not relevant in a time of peace. We believe the church is a place of spiritual struggles. As tensions have risen, our church announced a week of fasting and prayer. Three days in a row, the, the lights have been turned off in the city. We've been forced to meet in dark, adding, solemn, adding a solemn atmosphere to our prayers for peace. At the end of the week, those moments produced in us an inner strength to persevere. Through our prayers, we've gained confidence and peace. We believe God is with us, and that is the most important thing. During this critical moment, our church, was, which was about a thousand people attending on a normal Sunday, is also a place now of service. We're conducting several trainings of for performing first aid. People are learning how to apply bandages and stop bleeding and manage airways. <laughs> History of deed. If necessary, the church premises can be turned into a shelter. We have a good basement. 
may even provide a place for a military hospital. We've decided to stay both as a family and as a church. When this is over, the citizens of Kiev will remember how Christians have responded in their time of need. And while a church may not fight like the nation, we still believe we have a place to, a role to play in this struggle. We will shelter the weak, serve the suffering, mend the broken. And as we do, we offer the unshakable hope of Christ and his gospel. That's one story. Can I give you another one? Just sure, right, promise you. This guy on Twitter, Ryan Burton King, says, says this is his sister-in-law, Arissa is her name. She sent him a text message, by the will of God, I found myself at the epicenter of the fighting. It was a very busy day, constantly hand on the pulse, sirens, constant use of deaths, bombs near our house, sounds of explosion. I love everyone just in case. Good night. And then he says this, in the midst of this heartbreaking text was a beautiful story about Arissa realizing she needed to be a light. So praying with her unbelieving roommate to comfort her and in so doing, finding great peace herself as she's surrounded by war. In the midst of a war, there are brothers and sisters in Christ holding out the gospel. Now, why do I share this? Because you know in Edinburgh, we're in a time of peace. And when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. And we need each other. And if you're passionate about mission, and if you're passionate about love, and if you're passionate about making known the hope of the gospel, let's be inspired, and let's be emboldened, and let's be empowered by the witness of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And let us take full advantage of the resources we have in Christ. Let's start enjoying them and appreciating them. And let's go forward with the gospel of hope, of riches, and power. And let's make it known to this city and to this nation and to this continent that desperately needs in a time of potential war for all of us. The Prince of Peace. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father be brought to bear upon the world. You know what's amazing about our hope? It's because of Christ's resurrection. His victory is invincible. And so we go forward as brothers and sisters in Christ, eyes wide open to the hope, hearts full of our riches and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, as we bow our heads in your presence, we're conscious that you are with us, in us. You are here. Thank you for your presence. We pray that you would shine the torchlight of your word upon our hearts, that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts and the eyes of our faith, that we might see all that is ours in Christ. Stir our affections for our hope and for, our, and for the glorious inheritance we have. Make us know and feel the fact that you are powerfully at work within us to sanctify us and to use us as instruments in your hand to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to bear, both in word but also in deed. Or for everyone in this place, I pray that you would, myself included, that you would, you would humble us as we think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine right now. As we try and empathize for a moment of their real suffering. And yet their willingness for some of them to stay. Would you help us to have that same unashamed gospel confidence? In a nation right now where it's free for us to live lives as your people. God, we do pray for peace. You are the great peacemaker. You're the one who brought down the dividing walls of hostility. And so we pray that you would bring the gospel to bear upon Ukraine and Russia and all of Eastern Europe and all of the continent of Europe and even all of our world. We pray, come Lord Jesus. 
come. There is, we, we, we know that there is a day coming where there will be no more suffering, no more sin, no more death, no more wars, no more pain, no more crying. You will wipe every tear stained eye. And so as we wait for your coming, we wait in hope, we live in hope, we go in your power to make known your riches. Amen.